the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Direct, we beg you, O Lord, our actions by your holy inspiration, and carry them on by your gracious assistance, that every prayer and work of ours may begin always with you, and through you be happily ended to Christ our Lord. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. John the Apostle, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So the apocalypse is about the whole of history, past, present, and future, but we tend to think about the end times. We talk about apocalyptic times, and we say that we are living in apocalyptic times. And there's a lot of, of this type of thinking, both um, in religion and in the secular sphere as well. The literature and um, uh, and, and entertainment surrounding apocalyptic themes uh, abounds. You know, when I talked about the rapture, there was the Mayan apocalypse last year that didn't happen. And apparently, the the Mayan count, the Mayan sculptor of the calendar, just ran out of space. So, without realizing it, how many hundreds or thousands of years ago, he had no idea what what a problem he was causing for for our generation. Um, we talk about atomic po apocalypses, uh, alien apocalypses, zombie apocalypses, cyber apocalypses, uh, and, and the world, you know, and there's a lot of post-apocalyptism, you know, what would happen if everything just stopped and the world as we knew it came to an end, how, how we, would we survive? Well, our Lord does talk about one of these apocalypses apocalypses, if you will, in a manner of speaking, the zombie apocalypse. Because in, Genesis, in Revelation 3, verse 1, when he's talking to the church of Sardis, he says, I know your works, and I know you have, you have a name of being alive, and you are dead. Because they weren't living in grace. And in a way, we do have some, something like a zombie apocalypse in our world today because of the, the, the death in sin that is present. And very often the lack of awareness, you know, that, that, that there is a difference between being dead and alive. People have human life, but they don't have the life of grace and they have no interest in it. But there is a real, you know, there is a fundamental reason why people are, are uh, infatuated with the idea of an apocalypse and and uh, the stories and literature that surround the possibility of experiencing some kind of apocalypse because the threats are real. You know, there, there is a chance that we could blow the world up, that life as we know it could just come, come to a stop. Someone I know who works in the um, defense industry, you know, says that the real war right now is being waged on, uh, in, in the computer world through hacking and, and cyber attacks on you know, installations like in Iran, the whole nuclear thing that went on there. So there is a real possibility that life as we know it could come, come to an end. And you know, the, the, the threats of chemical and biological warfare and nuclear warfare are all you know, very real and we see what's happening in the Middle East, you know, in, uh, in Syria, and pray for the the great churches of the Middle East, uh, of Syria and and the Chaldean Church in in Iraq. They're experiencing, you know, what must seem to them like the apocalypse, like the end end of the world. And we know also that um, 
you know, we have other others that we should should be praying for, like the the people in the Philippines who have experienced these things uh, as in their own way as well. But also for us as Christians, you know, we experience the crisis within the church, and uh, we feel very often the kind of uh, isolation and uh, uh, character of the underdog, you know, that is, that is typical of persecution. We are persecuted. The church is persecuted. It's not something off in the future. It's right now. And the martyrs throughout the church, because of the persecution, are, are, are innumerable you know, over the years in China and many other places in, in the East. And then, of course, in, in the Middle East, you know, we hear of uh, people converting to Catholicism and then being arrested. Um, our own friars got kicked out of India because, uh, you know, they, they're not supposed to be uh, working there because, you know, it's not really legal to be spreading the faith uh, in India, which is, you know, not, not a place that we would... Uh, ordinarily, um, I think, uh, c uh, connect with persecution, but it's difficult to be a Christian uh, in this world, and in particular with the attacks on human life in, through abortion uh, and, and uh, the kind of government mandates and pressure and, and coercion that is, that is uh, requiring, you know, trying to require Catholic hospitals and Catholic health care workers to compromise. Um, the attack on, on marriage and family, whereby, you know, the, the, we, can't even, we can't even define marriage. You know, we don't even know what it is anymore. It just, it's whatever you want to make it. Um, uh, and, uh, the, and, and, and the consequences of that, of not being able to protect the innocence of children. You know, there's things that happen to children nowadays, uh, not within the church and outside of the church, that you know, are almost, the fact that we can think about these things and imagine them is an indication of how far down the road we are. The attacks on, on natural law, the attacks on and, and everything and anything sacred, nothing sacred anymore. And this is one of the great works of the church through Pope John Paul, particularly through Pope Benedict, that, that was part of his effort to restore, bring about a restoration, say, restoration of, of Christian identity to Europe, restoration of liturgical life, restoration of Catholic sensibility, the restoration of the sacred, that God is the center, not man. God is the center. Uh, the sacred is under attack. And then, of course, there is a tremendous crisis of faith and, and a loss of faith. So I think our... Gen the general populace's sort of attraction to themes apocalyptic reflect the times in which we live. You know, we live in, 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 in an apocalyptic age. I've said before, you know, we can make all kinds of comparisons as people do. This, this age is worse than, than many others. You know, I don't know if people living 500 or 600, you know, or 1,000 years ago would, you know, would, you know, Considering what they what they went through, the Middle Ages as Christian and as it was was a very very hard and brutal life, you know. So uh, we it's hard to make these comparisons, although we we do know that uh, the conflict, the cosmic conflict between good and evil, between the woman and the dragon, is is perennial. It goes on from the beginning until the end of time, from the fall of our first parents to the second coming uh, of Christ. So we would have, ev we have every right to feel like we need a survival guide and, and to want one, to want a survival guide for the world in which we live, the times in which we live. And I know that, that uh, you know, we, we would like to have God give us a list, you know, a bullet point, pointed list of the things that we need, we need to do and make, make everything make everything very, very, very clear. We'd like to have a website or a book to look up or a retreat to go to uh, where we could learn how to survive the times in which we live and to survive what is about to come. You know, and there's all things that are about to come and some of us live in fear. 
maybe with too much fear. We should live out our salvation in fear and trembling, as St. Paul says, but we shouldn't uh, allow fear to overcome us. We shouldn't be paranoid. I was just on the internet just looking around. Uh, you know, there's a kit on the internet for the three days of darkness where you can buy everything in a handcrafted wooden box that will get you through the three days of darkness. The holy candle, the holy water, uh, the rosary, a 72-hour holy candle to get you through the whole three days. Um, you know, uh, there are prophecies about the three days of darkness. I don't know what to make about it, but I do have a bit of a worry when, when it comes down to this kind of behavior. Um, you can tape your windows off, up, you know, to, 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 to guard yourself against the darkness outside. But that's not the darkness that, that is spoken about by St. John in the prologue to his gospel and throughout the apocalypse. That kind of darkness isn't going to be kept out with a, a trash bag and duct tape. Uh, the kind of survival guide we need is, is much different. It's not a kit. It's not a kit. Scott Hahn says that Re Revelation is a mystical book, not a training video or a how-to manual. So in a certain sense, we're out of luck. You know, we're not going to have the, the kind of thing that we would like to have with, with pictures and charts and directions and all the rest uh, in, in multiple languages. Um, one spiritual writer said, when you expect the world to end at any moment, you know there is no need to hurry. You take your time and you do your work well. It's the long road that we are on. It, it may turn out to be much, much shorter than we anticipated. Uh, but we have time on the road that we're on. You know, um, not time to waste, not time to be f frivolous or, or to live in, live in a state of sin. But we have the grace of perseverance to, to live as we ought for the time that we are here. Um, so, uh, what, is, what we need to do is be able to read the survival guide. There is, in a sense, there is a sense in which it is a survival guide. It's not like we would like to have, but it is there for us to use. And it was written, uh, given to St. John. The vision was given to St. John to help the early church persevere. And, um, you know, the, 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 what do you call it, the, uh, the, whether or not the apocalypse should, should be in the canon or not was something that was discussed and debated in the early church. And, and of course, it was included in the canon, and the, and the Council of Trent defined that, you know, and it was believed from the early times that it was part of the canon of sacred scripture. But there was some question about it, uh, partly perhaps because of its directed, being directed towards the early church, yet we know because it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is truly a vision that was given by God to St. John that, that it is for us. You know, it wasn't just for the early church, it is also for us. It does not answer all the matters of curiosity concerning how, who, and especially when. But it does give us the vision, as I was saying in the earlier conference. It gives us the plan and the encouragement to endure the slings and arrows of this present moment, the time that we have right now within the church and its crisis. So we need to read the guide uh, correctly. And that's why, you know, uh, a little bit of study of the catechism and the senses of sacred scripture would be helpful. You know, the, the scripture, the catechism teaches us, as the church has always taught, the fathers of the church believe this as well, that there's a literal sense and a spiritual sense in sacred scripture. And that the literal sense is a description of the person or place or event that, take, that is recorded in the scriptures that the human author, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recorded things that happened or made historical statements. St. Luke, for example, in the first verse of his gospel, talks about how he went to the eyewitnesses to verify the facts. 
and then recorded them. And the first two chapters of St. Luke's Gospel, you know, about the infancy of Jesus, about the conception of Jesus, the Annunciation, were things that only Our Lady knew. Some of them were things that only Our Lady knew. So St. Luke went to the Blessed Mother. This is why there's the tradition of uh, the icon of the Blessed Mother coming from St. Luke. He was a physician and an artist. He, he was the one who painted her. He had direct contact with her. And he received the information from her, although this was also done under the inspiration and protection of the Holy Spirit. There is this literal sense, the historical sense, of what is being uh, uh, recounted uh, in, in the scriptures. But there's also spiritual, a spiritual sense, another layer of meaning. So when our Lord heals a leper, you know, we can, we can more, think about the moral sense of that, you know, that Jesus heals us from sin. He delivers us from the plague of sin, which is a kind of, of leprosy. And so there, there are different, different senses of, of sacred scripture, literal and, and spiritual. And the spiritual senses sometimes tell us what to believe, like St. John calls Jesus the Lamb of God. And, and uh, that calls forth an understanding of who Jesus is as the true Paschal Lamb who offers himself in sacrifice and takes away our sins. And then I said there's a moral sense, as, as I was <laughs> recounting about uh, leprosy uh, pointing to sin. And, and there's a sense in which the sacred scriptures direct our attention towards the, our final end, our call to be with God in heaven, and, and our passing through uh, death, judgment, heaven, and, and, and ultimately arriving, hopefully, in heaven. So... This happens also in, in the apocalypse. But, you know, the apocalypse is complicated and confusing <coughs> because it is this prophetic vision, you know, that St. John must have received in ecstasy. And, and it, is, it is very symbolic and it is very multi, multi-layered. And so um, there are different schools of thought as to how the apocalypse is to be interpreted. And if you read Scott Hahn's book, The Supper of the Lamb, he'll talk about these in, in very clear and simple terms. Uh, but certain schools of thought believe that the apocalypse ref- refers exclusively or at least primarily to the first century church, that St. John was writing this letter to the Christians of his own time, and that, that's basically what it's about. And it doesn't have much of a reference to the future the prophecies about the end of the world were more or less pointing to the destruction of the temple and, and, and that type of thing. Um, <clears throat> so that would be one, you know, uh, uh, school of thought. So that the, the, the beasts and the political entities, you know, that were persecuting the church in the apocalypse was basically Rome, which was the persecutor of the early church at the time of St. John. Then there is a, uh, a, a school of thought which puts the emphasis on the future. So in this case, the beast would be, one of the beasts would be someone like, like Hitler, you know, that these things were pointing to future events, that what's recounted in, in the vision and the prophecy referred to future events. <clears throat> and then there's some that say that the, the apocalypse is ex- more or less exclusively uh, about the ideals of Christian life, that it's teaching us a lesson about how to live and as I say, you know, about the consolation that we should have because Christ is faithful to his promises and will ultimately lead us uh, to heaven. And then lastly, there's a historicist interpretation which sees the apocalypse as, a, as like a plan for the whole of history, that the whole of history is laid out in the apocalypse. Um, but I think on the face of it, you know, if we've, we've all been exposed to... to uh, the readings from the book of Revelations in the liturgy. And if you study your catechism or the writings of the saints, you'll find the, the scriptures from the, from the book of Revelations being used quite frequently. So we all kind of have a sense of how the church uses the book of Revelations. And, and you know, if we don't, we should. You know, we should be attentive to the way the church uses uh, 
we, the way the church uses the scriptures from the apocalypse. So for example, I think most, most Catholics know from having heard the liturgy, uh, the, 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 the text from the liturgy, the antiphons, etc., that the woman clothed with the sun is the Blessed Mother. You know, academics can argue about who the woman is. Catholic, you know, good Catholic scholars all, all believe that it, that it refers to the Blessed Mother and the Church. But, um, so we can, we can have a sense of how, how the scriptures are being used. But in the end, you know, Scott Hound's opinion, and I think probably most Catholic scholars consider that all of those things are valid. You know, the letters in the, uh, uh, sent to the ch- seven churches in the second and third chapter of Revelations were for the early church. They were for the, the diocese of Ephesus and the surrounding diocese over which St. John had direct influence. He was being inspired by Jesus to ha- have this, these messages sent to those who were in need in need of exhortation, correction, and encouragement. At the same time, there are events to be fulfilled in the scriptures, and it's, it's perfectly legitimate to think that, that uh, you know, there are things that may have happened in history or may happen in the future that, will, that are indicated by, um, uh, <clears throat> by the book of Revelations, although the church, generally speaking, doesn't define those kinds of things. You know, those, th- those are the types of things that are most interesting to us and the reason why a lot of people uh, are very interested in the apocalypse. But the church, generally speaking, has less interest in these things. You know, at the moment in which these kinds of prophecies become necessary for, our, for us, truly helpful to our um, salvation and our, and our well-being, then we will know that. You know, so speculation about whether the sign of the beast is a, so, you know, a universal identification card of some sort or a chip in someone's, you know, embedded chip in their body. Uh, yeah, maybe, you know, but, but uh, if, if, it, if it just leads to a, a sort of excessive fear, kind of, a kind of a modern-day apocalyptic paranoia, or what uh, Father Benedict Grishel calls, you know, uh, I think he called it Star Wars paranoia, um, then uh, it's not really helpful to our spiritual life. And it certainly isn't the most important thing about, about the apocalypse. Um, so there are things about the future. There, is, there are things about um, uh, the spiritual life, you know, how we are to live, absolutely. And there's things about the plan that God has for the whole of history. But as I say, I think the best thing that we could do on a regular basis to understand the apocalypse is to read the catechism and to listen to the liturgy. Because the liturgy, you know, I, I, at the moment I was holding up Jesus during the Mass and said, you know, behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. That's, the apoc- that's all from the apocalypse. You know, the, the apocalypse is a liturgical text. And, and it, it, it's, it's, it is so because the mass is at the center of the apocalypse. The mass is at the center of our Christian life as those who are called to live in the light of Christ's victory. As I said, heaven and, and earth are joined together in the holy sacrifice of the mass. And when we sing the Sanctus, when we sing the holy, 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 which is also from the Old Testament and the apocalypse, we are singing with the angels. We are united with all of heaven uh, in this worship of the one true God and our attention is directed toward eternity. Jesus is leading us to eternity through the Mass. And um, he is empowering us, he is strengthening us to persevere in the midst of crisis. And when we receive Holy Communion, not only are we being fed Spiritually, with the bread of life, our bodies are being prepared for their ultimate restoration in the resurrection from the dead at the end of time. So we need uh, to, you know, to be open to the, the correct interpretation of sacred scripture 
and be cautious when it comes to the, the more sensational type of things or, or particularly to people that are going to tell us exactly how this all is going to work out and who's what and uh, when it's going to all happen. It always is a, is a dangerous place to be. Um, I say that the, the apocalypse is, is a great deal, has a great deal to do with, with crisis. Now, uh, crisis is a state of instability resulting from some kind of threat. All right? Often something unexpected um, and, and sustained when it comes. And, and it threatens the existence of whatever is in crisis. And it, and it calls for a response. You know, we don't want to be in crisis mode. We want to get out of crisis. But some, very often crisis invokes a change. You know, it, it invokes a change. Sometimes that change takes the form of, of escape. Sometimes it takes the form of reform or renewal. Uh, it takes the form of reassessment. Um, it takes the form of perseverance. But families could be in crisis, societies could be in crisis, countries, states can be in crisis. The church can be and is always in crisis in a state in which its continued existence is threatened. But our Lord, you know, even before he was raised from the dead, promised his apostles, particularly through the person of St. Peter, that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And we have to remember this because already in the first century, St. John had to send this message out to the Christians so that they would have hope, that they wouldn't despair in the face of persecution and trial. And that message was meant for them in the first place. But in the providence of God's divine revelation and through the you know, inerrant uh, character of sacred scripture, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is also the message that Christ is sending to us, that St. John is sending to us. And, and it starts at the very beginning and it goes on till the end of time. You know, we could talk about this tomorrow, but Revelations 12 is a very, this is one of those instances where you can see the layered meanings, the different meanings of things. You know, it's Revelations 12, the, the woman clothed with the sun is about the fall of the angels before, uh, before physical creation was even made, before the creation of man. You know, it makes an oblique reference to the flight into Egypt when the woman goes out into the desert. It refers to the suffering that Our Lady experienced at the foot of the cross. It, 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 it refers to the fall of man even when the, when the serpent is on the shore of the sea, the dragon is on the shore of the sea and ready to go to war on the rest of her offspring, the woman's offspring. So there's all these layers of meaning it, goes, it extends from, and you know, the, the complementary, again, I'll, I'll go into this tomorrow, the complementary scene to Revelations 12 is actually the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 3.15, with the fall of man and, and the attack of the dragon in the garden. But I'll talk, I just say, I want to say that it goes from the beginning to the end, from the beginning of time to the end. And, and, and the state, the status quo of the world and of the church is crisis. It's the perpetual state. And so we need to realize the apocalypse is not about the end of the world in the first place. It is the state of affairs of the whole of history. And Our Lady is always present. Even, you know, she was given a, the, the angels before, the, before their entrance into heaven were given a vision, some of, the, some of the great theologians say, of the child and the mother. And the ones that were willing to worship the child and venerate the mother 
entered into heaven and those who refused went to hell. So she's present in the whole of sacred history in, in, in some sense. And uh, she personifies the church. And the church is always at war and always victorious. But it begins, it begins with Christ himself. Our salvation arises out of crisis, a threat to the existence of Christ and his church. It's the crisis of the cross. And the cross was, was not in anyone's estimation except our lords and our ladies, anything but the death of everything. The cross was the end of everything to everybody but Jesus and Mary. Even Peter, who, to whom the church, the future and the perseverance of the church was entrusted and to whom the promise that the church would not fail was attached, even he didn't believe in, in, in our Lord's victory over death. You know, our Lord said to Peter, you are, you know, he's, who do people say that I am? And they had all kinds of answers. People thought all kinds of things about Jesus. Who do you say that I am? He says to the apostles. And Peter speaks out above all of them and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And our Lord says to him, Peter, you did not say that because of, of anything you learned by yourself, but God has revealed this to you. And then just a few moments later, Christ entrusts the church to him. And then a few moments later, he talks about the cross. What does Peter say? He says, far this be this from you to do this, to allow this to happen. And our Lord says exactly the opposite of what he had just said. He says, you're not thinking like God, you're thinking like man. Get behind me, you Satan. So the cross was rejected even by Peter in the beginning. And St. Paul, this was the crux of the matter. He preached Christ and him crucified because nothing else mattered besides that. And nothing else, <clears throat> ten, you know, not everything would work. That, that, was, that had to be preached, the death and resurrection of the Lord. And he said that our Lord's cross is foolishness, the stumbling block to the Jews, a scandal, a scandal to the Jews who are looking for deliverance from Rome, not a Messiah who would die on a cross. And the Gentiles were looking for wisdom, the wisdom of this world, and to preach salvation through, the, through death, even if there's a resurrection afterwards, was for them foolishness. But our salvation arises out of crisis, and people had a problem with that. You know, on the cross, Jesus is not so much the teacher. He does teach from the cross, but he is the shepherd. He leads us into eternal life through the cross. And this was the lesson that all of his followers had to learn. Peter learned it later on after he had not only, you know, stumbled over the scandal of the cross, uh, he also betrayed our Lord the night before he died, you know, denied him. Our Lord said to him, when you have regained, you know, your, your strength, you are to strengthen and feed my brethren. But at the Sea of Galilee, our Lord said, follow me. Where was our Lord leading him? Ultimately, he's leading him to the cross. He said, when you are young, you went where you wanted to go. When you are older, you will be bound and taken where you do not want to go. The whole of our faith arises from crisis. And while some were willing to accept Jesus, the teacher, who taught the way to eternal life, they weren't willing to follow Jesus, the shepherd, who leads to the cross, who leads to the Eucharist. And, and this is partly the message of the apocalypse. You know, it's partly what we need to learn in the survival guide. The survival guide is, is, is about bearing witness to Jesus Christ, becoming 
a martyr for Christ. Whether it's a white martyrdom that is typical of all those who are faithful to Jesus in their daily life by avoiding sin and being faithful to him in difficult circumstances, or the red martyrdom that comes all too frequently to those who profess their, their faith in the face of the beasts, the beast of the state, and the beast of false religion. You know, those days may come. I mean, they are, they are here for some. They may come for us as well. But for all of us, it is going to be about persevering through crisis and embracing the mystery of the cross. And, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, this is a problem for, for us. You know, it's not like it's only the people that live outside the gambit of the church that have a problem with this. You know, people have a problem with suffering, and we, we want comfort, you know, uh, and the world promises to provide that, happiness and comfort and paradise on earth. It's difficult to attain, but everyone is chasing after it. Um, but we also have a problem with suffering and, and being convinced of its salvific character, especially when it's the church that is suffering, especially when those who are following Christ seem to get just pie in their face for having been faithful to the Lord. But it's never been any different than that. It's never been any different than that. It's always been that way. You know, the circumstances may be slightly different in the church, but in reality, nothing has changed. There is nothing new under the sun. You know, our Lord leads us all to Jerusalem, and we don't <laughs> want to go. You know, we don't want to go. If the church were really faithful, we think, you know, the situation would be much better. and We want to blame somebody Blame the Pope, blame the bishops, blame priests. And, you know, we all have our share of blame. You know, the blame can go all the way around the circle and we can all take our fair share of it. We can all, t you know, take from, the, from the, the plate and have our fair share of the blame. But that doesn't really solve anything. Um... The fact of the matter is that in the face of all this, Christ is always present. Chesterton said, the accumulating facts is so crushing a story would ordinarily lead people to despair because the time in which Christ lived was a, was a time of great difficulty and persecution and for everything that our Lord did to bring life and light and healing he died. And on the way to Calvary, he said to the women, he, he, he said, if they do this to the wood while it is green, what will they do to it when it is dry? And that has been verified throughout the centuries. And that is why the apocalypse of St. John was necessary and why it's still necessary uh, today. Why we need to be... Um, encouraged and strengthened by the message of Christ that he is present in his church and especially present in the mystery of the cross. We'll see as we go through parts of the apocalypse, you know, we can do only very, very little of what's actually in, in, in the book, but it sort of helped, well, hopefully this retreat will help give us a direction that we can pursue in our understanding uh, of, of the apocalypse. But we will see that the cross is at the center of this book. The mystery of the cross, its salvific character, and that while Jesus promises victory and deliverance, while it is the wedding feast of the Lamb in which all the martyrs participate, it is not a promise that we will be delivered from the cross. There is no such promise in the Gospels or in the Apocalypse in this prof great prophetic book. You know, at the time in which uh, uh, Blessed John the 23rd, soon to be Saint John the 23rd, at the hands of Pope Francis, uh, at the time of the opening of, of the council, he expressed a great deal of optimism 
you know, for the modern world, and and that and that the church would be able to speak the message of Christ, with with great uh, joy and hope. You know, the document of the Second Vatican Council on the Church in the Modern World is entitled "God Imit Spes," joy and hope. That was the character of of that moment in time, not only within the church, but also within society. Pope Benedict has referred to it as the sort of uh, the, the Kennedy era, you know, the time of Camelot. There was all this hopefulness about, about this change of direction in the world. And as we know, you know, the hope dwindled very quickly and we ended up with a lot of, like a, a lot of baggage you know, in secular society and and in the church, and so sometimes there is there is now this sort of reaction against against the Vatican Council or against the kind of um, uh, directedness towards a hopeful future. You know, a new Pentecost, which was promised by the Church at that time, um, but I don't think. I don't think the, the, the opposite or, or, or the, 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 the corrective to sort of a naive kind of optimism should, ought to be pessimism. You know, there is, there is an idea, in, a current that, that runs throughout church history that was erroneous about how the church is always in decline and the end, you know, the end is near in the sense of this sort of fearful, very fearful paranoia about the direction that the world is taking. It doesn't start, you know, after the 60s. It's, there's always been this current there. There's always been various kinds of utopian ideas about Christianity. You know, the millennium's gonna come, the thousand year reign, you know, a new dispensation of one sort or another. The church is no longer gonna be necessary. The Holy Spirit's going to be there, and we don't need the sacraments. There's always been that, and there's always been the opposite. You know that the church is always in a state of decline, and and it's all going to bottom out very soon. Couldn't get any worse than it is, and the only way is to try to go backwards and try to regain the ground that we have lost. Both these, you know, these tendencies can manifest themselves in, in quite pronounced and dangerous extremes. One could be characterized as sort of naive optimism, the other as a kind of morose pessimism. Chesterton, uh, I've forgotten which book, I think, I I don't remember which book it was. He talks about pessimism and optimism and pessimism, the optimist and the pessimist. He says that the optimist is the one who thinks that everybody is right except the pessimist. Everybody's right except the pessimist. And, and the pessimist believes uh, that everybody's wrong except for him. And, 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 and both of them lead in bad directions. He said, we don't really need optimism or pessimism in that sense. What we need is loyalty. What we need is loyalty. You know, and it, and it, and it's it, it's the the it's what marriage means. You know, I know there are a lot of problems in people's families, and this is not judgment, but it's talk it's talk about why God instituted marriage and what it ultimately means, and Christ's love for His church, His willingness to die for His church, so that He could present to Himself a bride that's holy and immaculate. It's about Fidelity is about loyalty. It's about a willingness to go the whole distance, no matter what the cost. That's what the apocalypse is trying to encourage us to do. That's what the grace, you might say, of the of revelations is. And again, Scott Hahn points out that it's present here in the holy sacrifice of the mass in a very profound way. And so the end is near. It's true. Could come tomorrow could come tomorrow for us individually, you know, in our own personal life. It could come for the whole world. We don't know. End is near, but so is the victory. 
Victory is now. Apocalypse now means the victory is now. We participate in it. Not completely. Theologians talk about, Pope Benedict, Cardinal Ratzi talk about the, the aspect of the church and, and, and our spiritual reality being already and not yet at the same time. You know, we are experiencing already heaven, the kingdom of God, the coming of Christ, the victory of Christ, and yet it's not experienced in its, in its fullness. We are, we are on the way, in via. Uh, we are on our way to eternity. And so reading the apocalypse is like reading the symbols on the Easter candle. If you've ever been to the Easter liturgy for the vigil, uh, on Saturday night uh, before before Easter Sunday, uh, there is the preparation and blessing of the candle, which is one of the options for the priest during the vigil and out, out by the Easter fire. And as he cuts the vertical line of the cross on the candle symbolically, which is, you know, joins heaven and earth, he says, Christ yesterday and today. And then as he draws the, the horizontal line of the cross, which is the sign that's, that, the, that the elect are marked with, he says the beginning and the end. So Christ yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, the meaning of all of history from the beginning of time to its very end. And then he cuts at the top of the cross the alpha, and he says, the Alpha and below the cross, the Omega, the beginning and the end, and the Alpha and Omega are our Lord's words for himself in Revelation. All time belongs to him, he says, as he cuts the first numeral of the current year in the upper left corner of the cross. And all the ages, he cuts the second numeral of the current year in the upper right corner of the cross. To him be glory and honor as he cuts the third numeral in the lower left, through every age and forever, amen, as he cuts the fourth numeral on the lower right-hand side of the cross. That symbol reminds us that the presence of Christ cuts across all time and history, and his is the last word. His is the last word. We refrain from saying Alleluia during uh, Lent so that we understand its meaning. We praise the Lord for his victory and we experience it in the mystery of Easter. And, um, you know, during... Uh, we, we were living during this year in the, in the time of uh, the year of faith, which is going to end actually next Sunday. And so in a way, this is it's kind of appropriate that we're having this retreat now because we're, we're experiencing liturgically what we're talking about, you know, because it's the end of the liturgical year when we think about the last things. And it's the end of the year of faith, which will end on the face of Christ the King, who is the center and Lord of all history and whose word will never fail. That is a message that all of us need to have. It's the message that Pope Benedict wanted us to have when he um, inaugurated the, the year of faith. And it's the one that Pope Francis, I know, wants us to, to hear and believe in as well. Jesus Christ, the Lord of history, who is our salvation and who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of the end. His is the last word and that is the word that we reflect upon uh, during this retreat uh, on the apocalypse. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for all your benefits. You live and reign forever and ever. May the souls of the faithful departed, the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen.